The world is in a profound medical and economic crisis. We do not yet know how that medical crisis will play its way through. Perhaps millions around the world will die. That depends on how we manage, how we respond. The economic crisis, in my view, uh, forgive me, I'm an economist, is likely to be potentially severe and prolonged. We have to fight the recession that is coming now, that has already begun. And in so doing, we have to protect the vulnerable, particularly those who are dependent on day-to-day -day income to put food on the table. But we must also think how we come out of this crisis. We must build a different form of development, something that's sustainable, inclusive and resilient. We must build back better, and that's what I want to discuss today. But as we think about building back better, let us be clear just how fragile and dangerous that old system was, the system that which we regarded as normal up to now. We cannot go back there. That damage that we have inflicted on our biodiversity, on our environment, on our climate, is intimately related to the pandemic, as well as, of course, being profoundly destructive in its own direct ways. Let's just link the biodiversity, the climate and the pandemic. Viruses that come in this way are some combination of wild animals, human animals and domestic animals. These three interact and of course they interact amongst themselves and as a result of climate change we find that birds from different continents are meeting where they didn't meet before in ways they didn't meet before and that can likely breed new viruses as the uh, great biologist Lucy Shapiro from Stanford has shown. Those new viruses can come as new forms of bird flu. We've seen what happens through swine flu. We can have all kinds of interactions between uh, wild pigs and um, domestic pigs and so on. Those are the kinds of interactions which profoundly change when we change biodiversity, when we change the climate, when we change our environment. And that means that one of the dangers of our old system was indeed that this kind of pandemic has become more likely. There will be more. We must act to reduce the probability, the severity, and we must act in much better ways on managing a pandemic. We do that through better anticipation. But changing that probability by changing our relationship with biodiversity and the environment is a fundamental part of a strategy to deal with pandemics. And of course, uh, even more important, dealing with the damage that we have done to our climate. It's not just the pandemics, we've behaved in irresponsible ways too, and we've generated antimicrobial resistance, which means that we can handle uh, serious diseases much, with much greater difficulty because many of our antibiotics have uh, become weak or useless as a result. Again, a lot of that from the antibiotics that we pump into our domestic animals. All of this illustrates the way in which domestic animals, human animals, wild animals, biodiversity, climate, pandemics are all profoundly interrelated. Let me turn to the economic crisis. It's helpful to think of that in three phases. The first is the rescue where we are now, the medical and the economic rescue protecting the vulnerable, stopping the economy from imploding, of course, dealing with the medical as best we can. From that is the recovery. The recovery means how we come out of this slump, how we regenerate, how we promote economic activity. I hope that this will come, it depends which country, of course, in the coming months. But as we work to get people back to work, to restart our economy, what we must do is to plan ahead and think what kind of a world are we trying to build. We must commit ourselves to not going back, commit ourselves to building back better. That transformation to a new kind of development, sustainable, inclusive, resilient, could be enormously attractive. We will invest in new infrastructure. We will develop our energy, our transport, and our cities, and the way we manage 
our water and communications. We will find new ways of doing this. This will be uh, innovative, full of discovery and investment and economic development. And of course, we'll be investing in our people at the same time, education, skills, and of course, crucially, the health systems. But it's not just about the physical capital, our physical infrastructure, that will have to change, of course, but it's much, much more than that. It's also, and this is crucial, it's about our natural infrastructure, our forests, our land, our air, our water, our oceans, our biodiversity across the board. That is a crucial part of the new investment for this new world, this new development and growth uh, strategy, which we must uh, follow. If we do that, if we invest in our physical capital in the right way, in our human capital in the right way with the skills and the health and, and education and so on, and we invest in our natural capital and natural infrastructure in the right way, we can have cities where we can move and breathe and be productive, and we can have ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. <coughs> that is an enormously attractive prospect but we have to commit ourselves to that now. We must to build our recovery with that vision in mind and take the recovery to the transformation to this new story of growth and development. If we do that, then we will reduce the likelihood of severity of pandemics, which we will improve our biodiversity, but above all, we will create a climate that uh, is resilient and strong and not the deeply destructive climate which we're creating and which will get much worse if we do not change our ways. The climate crisis, the climate consequences would be far longer lasting and far more damaging than even the profound damage from this COVID crisis. So we must build back better. We can build a much better system. We can avoid the major dangers from climate change and in so doing, we'll find a much more attractive way of living. So that's what building back better means. How do we get there? Well, we've got to have the creative ideas. That's what we're discussing today and that's what we must all be working on. We have to have the good arguments and the evidence. It's not just uh, assertion, it has to be uh, a demonstration of what's happening and we can do that. We've seen uh, how the uh, environment has been transformed in these few weeks where we've been using our vehicles much less in our cities. We can see how that happens, but we can do it now in different ways, not by stopping everything, but by doing things in different ways. We can see how cheap the renewable energy has become. We can see the possibilities in electric and other forms of transportation. So we can produce the arguments, we can produce the evidence. It will need, in addition, social action, people coming together, presenting those arguments, presenting those ideas, organising and acting. And of course, it will need political leadership and that will require the public discussion which we're having today. It will require the pressure. So this can be done. We can see what's involved. Let us build back better. Thank you, uh, Nick for that lovely 10 minute uh, overview and perspective on where we are as society. Uh, obviously, uh, there is much to be addressed, much to learn and much to action. But uh, you know, one always gets this sense that this is not the first and probably this is not the last. And why is it that we never seem to learn? Is it because we don't see the linkages between our actions and the consequences? Or is it just human arrogance that feels that each of these can be managed on the fly because we are super intelligent? It's difficult to be, obviously, to be categorical in the answer, which is, has to look at human nature and who we are. But I think it's fair to say that the last uh, 70 years have been very unusual in human history. 
and we have grown very rapidly in terms of material product. Um, we've got much better at keeping people alive. So we've seen life expectancy in the last, last uh, 70 years or so go up by perhaps 30 years in a very short period of time. That, of course, means that uh, notwithstanding falls in birth rates, it means population has gone up. And we've seen output per head, material output per head largely go up. So basically, you've had in those 70 years a uh, population increase by a factor of around three in the world, and output per capita go up by a factor of around four. So in a period of 70 years, that output has gone up by a factor of about 12. It's enormous. And of course, that has been largely fossil fueled on the energy front. So it means that really for the first time in human existence, the human being has put the whole planet under pressure. So I think that's a partial answer to your question, Paul, that you know, we've been around as uh, Homo sapiens perhaps for 250,000 years. And it's in the last 70 years that we've grown so big in our numbers and in uh, our, our output and consumption that we've put a pressure, uh, an enormous pressure, um, on the environment, the planet in which we live. That's why we now call this the Anthropocene, where the previous 10,000 years were the Holocene, a period of really great stability in our climate and uh, our environment. So we have put ourselves in an unprecedented position as human beings. And we now have to use something which is much stronger than the simple form of evolutionary learning. Um, you know, if we do stupid things, we burn ourselves by touching hot things. And if we make a big mess of our world, like we did after, in the 20 years up to the Second World War, uh, you look back and you learn. And after the Second World War, um, we realized that the vulgar nationalism, um, the um, conflictual behavior was deeply destructive and that we had to find ways of working together. And indeed, we, have to find, we had to put together economic systems which functioned better as economic systems. So but that was both when you touch something hot and you recoil or you mismanage society on a grand scale as we did in the uh, two or three decades up to the second world war then you learn by looking back but we have to do something which is more fundamental now because of the collective pressure we put on the planet we you have to use our ability to anticipate and look forward and we have an, anti an ability to anticipate and look forward, but it's hard. We have to be able to look long term. We have to think about risk. We have to think about something now, which is right outside our experience. It's not that we've experienced it before directly. And we, uh, some things that we're anticipating, like three, four degrees centigrade uh, increased average global temperature, God forbid. But we're, that would be right outside human experience. And of course, a lot of these things are about things that are a result of all the things we do together. You know, if, if you reach out and touch something hot, it's your own hand that's touched something hot. It's you that have got into that mess. But this is something we've created by all acting together in an irresponsible way. So all that is to say, uh, Paul, that this is a very big challenge. And in some ways, it's new. Uh, we've learned to learn, but we have, and we've learned to anticipate, but my goodness, now we have to learn, have to put that ability to anticipate to a use with a great urgency, which is not sufficiently uh, understood. All right. So in that context, you know, in your talk, you talk about two important actions we need to take. One is to fix the damage that we have already done and the other and probably the more important thing is to 
change the normal. Yeah. yeah. So both need fundamental change in current economic philosophy. So is the world heading towards a redefined construct of economics and economic philosophy? Probably a more humane people-centric approach that also actively uh, lives in harmony with nature? I hope we can. And it's our duty, and this is the reason we're having this discussion, it's our duty to try to build a much better economics. Uh, economics that ignores the environment uh, is just bad economics. Um, if we pursue our environmental goals and concerns without recognition that we live in a world where people make their own way, where they take economic decisions, if we pursue the environment uh, challenges, if we, if we try to tackle these problems, um, by putting, by trying to dismiss the economics or putting it to one side, then we'll fail. So if we pull them apart, you know, if we rank economics above environment, we will fail. If we try to tackle the environment without thinking about the economics, we will fail. We have to put them together. And yes, it does mean doing economics differently. My own subject, I'm a professor of economics, um, has not done well on its analysis of environmental issues and it has damaged our subject but of course much more importantly it's damaged our world so we have to learn how to restore our forests how to restore degraded land how to improve our oceans and we know that given a chance nature can restore quite quickly yes sadly Sadly, not always. <laughs> you, can do, you can do irreparable damage. But we do know that if you back off from the forests, they can put themselves back together quite quickly. But you have to give them a chance. So in order to do that, we have to have an economic organization which values those things. Uh, we have to have an economic organization which is capable of acting together to protect those things. So valuing those things is really to understand our actions and their consequences much better. Organizing so that society can protect those things is a political challenge and it needs public discussion. It needs uh, education, it needs interaction, it needs fantastic NGOs like Sanctuary. This is the kind of thing that it needs in order for us as a society to be able to uh, make the organizational changes, make the values, uh, put in practice the values that could see our economics done differently. But our economics must be done differently. All right. I just want to bring you into India. Uh, you're an old hand at India and you know exactly, you know, what goes on on the ground here. So uh, the world and India seem to be staring at a recession. Uh, and countries have obvious constraints in terms of the fiscal space that they have now. So where should we be focusing our near-term actions? And I'm alluding to the, you know, hot life versus livelihood debate that is occupying yeah. us currently. I think the um, first thing is to tackle the medical emergency, um, but think very hard and quickly about how we get people back to work. So um, we can wait too long, we can wait too long, and then people will die as a result of our having waited too long. So many people in India, not only in India, but particularly in India, so many people live from hand to mouth. The informal sector is by far the, the biggest sector relative to informal. That means the danger of people um, becoming um, malnourished or even starving is, is very real. So we have to try to get back to work as soon as we can. But as we do that, we have to try to bring to the table um, ways in which we can really bring down the risk of getting people 
back into operation, getting the economy moving together. And, and those are challenges which are different in different, uh, in different countries. But I think testing and testing is very important so that you can establish who it is that uh, is likely to um, uh, bring contagion into the rest of the community. That means that those who are uh, not contagious, who don't have uh, the virus, can have uh, the greater freedom. Um, wearing of masks and gloves can be uh, very important as well. So I think we've got to the point in many economies, and my guess is India too, where relaxation is necessary now, but it has to be done in a way that really works to bring down the risks of uh, spreading the virus. And that will be for each society to work out uh, itself. But the greater the informality in the economy, the more difficult it is to support people and uh, the greater the risk to human life by extending the lockdown. But these are very hard decisions uh, of, um, of balance. On the fiscal space story, my instincts now are that we have to take some bold macroeconomic decisions around the world. One of the key differences between this crisis now in the economy, I'm switching to the economy now away from the medical and health, one of the distinctive features of this crisis is that it's truly global. All the economies in the world are being hit. If you look back to 2008-10, actually it was not all the economies in the world that was hit. It was in large measure the rich countries that made a mess of their financial uh, system. Now that had knock-on effects for other countries. But what you've seen is that these effects in other countries are not simply knock-on effects from elsewhere. These are effects happening inside the country itself, all across the world. So this is really a, a, a risk of a, a great depression of a kind I have not seen in my lifetime. And uh, I'm not a young <laughs> person. And so that I think is uh, extremely important. So that means, in my view, that the risk of inflation, the risk of deficits is much less than the risk of allowing a great depression to take place. There's no route without risk now, clearly. Question, question is, what is the most risky? And I think that uh, austerity across the world is in many ways the most risky macroeconomic policy to follow because we've seen in many countries of the world how just in this last 10 years, the political and social fabric has been damaged. And we've lost social cohesion in many places I count my own country in that. We've lost uh, some degree of political trust, uh, mutual tolerance. And those come, those problems come if we mismanage economies, as we saw in Europe big time between the uh, First World War and the Second World War. So I do think that this is a moment when we have to be um, willing to act strongly on the fiscal and monetary uh, fronts. Uh, economists are often conservative about these things. And I think in normal times, so am I. But these are not normal times. So I do think that we need a strong expansion of demand, a willingness for some monetary financing, a willingness to increase uh, borrowing for the next year or two and then let's see how it develops uh, from there. But it's a moment when the world has to act together, and it's a world where debt reduction is going to be inevitable, because many developing countries have seen a collapse in remittances. Actually, the fall in remittances has been the biggest since records began. Many countries depend on commodities for exports and have seen a reduction in commodity prices, and we've seen capital flight so 
the poorer countries have the weaker health systems and the weaker social security systems, and they have the fall in remittances and the fall in commodity prices and the capital flight. So this is a moment where we need internationalism to try to help with those issues of, uh, of debt. So sorry to sort of be a bit of a gloomy economist on those things, but it does need the big countries of the world. And of course, India is a big country, China, Europe, ideally the United States, but uh, you know, with the current occupant of the White House, you have limited expectations. But it should not stop Europe, China, India, the big countries of Asia, Latin America, Africa, acting together uh, to make common cause in, uh, in this crisis and try to keep demand going across the world in very difficult circumstances. Thanks for that. Uh, Sanctuary Nature Foundation, as part of its uh, philosophy, sees itself straddling the trijunction of biodiversity, climate change, and economics. Um, are all our symbols of industrial and economic infrastructure like dams, uh, public transportation systems, national health systems, bioreserves, education and pedagogy, all going to take on a new meaning? Uh, some have to be, I guess, drastically downsized and reviewed uh, for their efficacy and you know, sustainability, while others in terms of, say, budgetary allocations, uh, countries will have to review priorities. Uh, so do you see composition of national budgets altering fundamentally in terms of what gets allocated where? Um, I've just argued that the uh, budget should not be cut hard at the moment um, because of the overall macroeconomic position. But I do think, and I fully agree, Paul, that the composition of budgets needs to change because we have to learn from this. The uh, climate change and the probability of severe pandemics are linked. Um, we've seen now evidence that uh, birds are meeting over the Bering Straits from different continents, which did not meet before. And that means that new types of bird flu, new types of virus can arise. Um, climate change and loss of biodiversity and habitat pushes wild animals to come into closer contact with domestic animals. Again, you can find uh, the viruses of various kinds being transmitted. Of course, the relationship between human beings and wild animals and domestic uh, animals are altered by these changes. So what we've done to climate and biodiversity makes it more likely that we are going to run into severe pandemics. So part of our insurance policy uh, is to invest much more strongly in climate and biodiversity. And of course, those investments have tremendous returns, even if you've never heard of um, pandemics. Um, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful, um, cities where you can move and breathe, those are great returns, even if you've never heard of climate change. So what we've got now, and I hope we learn this lesson, is a whole range of investments now which were always profitable, but maybe now we understand that they're profitable if we think of social profit, economic profit, environmental profit in the right kind of way. So yes, this is a moment for reallocation. This is a moment for restoring degraded land, for investing in uh, our forests, because they are infrastructure. They shape the water supply. You can invest in dams, they were trying to build infrastructure that gives you a more strong and reliable water supply. Forests do that too. And we've probably underestimated and underinvested in the forests and overinvested in the dams. So this is a moment to put that economics uh, to that we were discussing just now, the wise economics that builds in the story of the environment, to put that to good use. And this is a moment to reallocate 
And this is a moment where we can realize that that infrastructure not only provides us water services and, uh, and, and agricultural services <clears throat> and uh, you know, breathing services and all those things, that natural infrastructure, it not only does that, but if we do it well, some of it, not all of it, but some of it can make money in a direct way. Yes. A direct way. I mean, India has uh, underexploited its potential for tourism of the natural world and its natural assets. There's yes. so much more that India could do, both, of course, first and foremost, for the Indian people themselves, but also to attract uh, foreign uh, tourism by investing much more strongly in its natural infrastructure. I've had the privilege to be with um, people like yourself and Bitu Sagal and, and to spend time in India's forests. They are fantastic. And if we invest in them much better, of course, I hope we as, we as India uh, invest in them much better, there's tremendous returns that could get. And a lot of that is uh, good employment for poorer people. So if we think this through, I completely agree, Paul, this is a moment where we can invest better, more wisely. And if we do it well, we can make good revenues and good incomes for people at the same time. Okay. I'm going to ask you one last question and then let you go, Nick. And that's, again, you know, I started with a philosophical question and I'm going to end with one. Yeah. Do we as a society uh, need to redefine our value systems? I mean, it's probably the immediate answer is obviously yes, but our measures of success and our heroes, you know, uh, will we make fair and responsible consumption, sharing of the planet, coexistence, our creed for the future, and from where we'll draw our heroes and, you know, people we want to emulate? I hope so. And this is a moment where public discussion can recast those values. Um, again, let me not overdo the analogy of the Second World War, but I was born uh, just after the uh, Second World War and uh, just before uh, independence for India. And out of that period of uh, trauma of you know, two world wars and uh, a great depression, attitudes did change. And the uh, movement uh, to decolonize came in large measure to be accelerated. Of course, it was there already, went way back into the, uh, into the um, 19th uh, century. But it was accelerated by the uh, traumas of that experience. So the traumas of experience, I think, can help change values. And they should. And we've seen our heroes, and let me use an example from my own country, but in my telephone calls and emails with my friends in India, I think there's similar examples there. Our heroes are people who work in the health service, who restock and, man, and, and, restock and, um, and look after our shops. They're the people who pick up our rubbish, our garbage. And they're being recognized as heroes now. They're actually, in, in many ways, the people who, get, who don't get paid particularly well in our society. When the UK discusses its visa system, they're the kind of people who might get dropped out. Yet I think that has been re-evaluated, re-understood, different kinds of heroes. I think before... Um, the crisis really monopolized our attention, we started to see climate heroes. And I think our young people, um, the people we see at university, the people we see at schools, our young people were becoming climate heroes. They were standing up for the future. They'd put themselves on the right side of history in a way which I think, if you look back to the young people in the 80s and 90s, um, 20, 30, 40 years ago. That wasn't so true. But I think in the last few years, 
I, uh, many of our young people have become heroes and heroic in looking to the future, thinking about consequences of actions. So if you take the example of who it is that is the essential worker, that we've understood what essential means over these last uh, weeks, if you think who it is that's looking ahead, often that's our uh, young people. I think we are starting to see new heroes. What we must do is to celebrate them now and not forget, go on celebrating them into these coming days because traumas can change values. We are in a trauma now. And I think that uh, being in a trauma does not, preclude, does not preclude reflection. The world reflected during the Second World War. It did. It reflected in India and the UK and uh, beyond. And now is the time to reflect about what kind of world we want to build, to build back better, if you like. And there, uh, for all the reasons we've discussed, our time, our emphasis on the natural environment, on our forests and our air and our land and our water and our ocean, I think the reflection during this drama should point us absolutely and directly to the importance of thinking much more carefully about nature and making sure we look after it and benefit from it much better than we've done in the past. So lovely. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, we probably run out of time. And uh, all I have to say in summary is that, you know, lead the way, Nick. Uh, you are the, you know, you, you, you can tell us, you know, as you have been uh, to learn from all our past actions, uh, no more conferences and great big gatherings. I think it's time for action. And uh, COVID has given us that opportunity to pause, reflect, and uh, make some fundamental changes in the way we are collectively going forward. Thank you so thank much. And thank you from me, Paul. Um, the I've been coming to India now since 1974, uh, usually at least twice a year. Um, I fear this year may maybe only once, but we'll, we'll see. But I've learned I've learned so much from my Indian friends, from Indian life, uh, from Indian culture that uh, it's had an enormous effect on my own understanding. So I I am in the debt of India. So thank you very much, and thanks particularly to you and to Bitu and all the wonderful people in Sanctuary.